This is the second in a series of videos we're examining, where we are examining the basic properties of holy angels, which are obedient and servants of God. Um, first question I want to ask is, and keeping in mind that that angels are really similar to us in some ways and that they are a person and just like you are a person who has senses and is able to change things and be a causal agent you're able to do stuff um, you're able to be self-aware you're able to be response able you're able to respond and to to do things and to be productive you're able to communicate and interact with other people which is kind of what a person does angels angels are able to do all those things uh, they're weird to us because they don't have a flesh and blood body but uh, flesh and blood body is not a requirement for being a person uh, the inner man which we all know our, our inner sense of well-being and self-awareness and consciousness is uh, it's not dependent upon our physical body and it will in fact last out after our physical body dies um, so just asking some basic questions about angels um, how many angels are there and so Psalm 68 verse 17 the chariots of God are 20,000 even thousands of angels the Lord is among them as in Sinai in the holy place Hebrews 12.22 But ye are come unto Mount Zion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and unto an innumerable company of angels. Revelation 5.11 And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts, and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands and thousands. And so, what's interesting from these numbers... Uh, Probably the, the best answer that we can give is, is what the author of Hebrews says in 1222, an innumerable company of angels. And so uh, a lot of times the, the phrase is used in the Old Testament as the sand on the seashore. Well, is, is there a finite amount of sand on the seashore? There is, as the stars in the sky. Are there a finite number of stars in the heavens and could could you theoretically count them yes but it would take a very long time and you having to come up with some kind of a methodology to be precise and make sure that you're not undercounting or overcounting right and so the point is is that there's a lot of angels and so if you think about possibly 80 to 100 billion humans have ever lived on the face of the earth could there surely be at least at least that number of angels? And I would say probably. And I, I would honestly estimate that there are, are billions or trillions of angels. Just based upon my experience of the spiritual realm and how plentiful spirits seem to be, there seems to be no shortage. It is a finite number, but there, do, there just doesn't seem to be any shortage of, of angels. And so the answer is we don't know exactly but there's a lot of angels, and again, probably somewhere around billions of trillions. Um, something that we recognize is that there is a relationship to spirits. And so, um, keeping in mind John chapter 1, in the beginning the Word was with God, the Word was God. Um, and then verse 14, the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us. Every other descriptor of reality is just we experience it one way or another and then we describe what it is that we experience. Well, the Bible, not so. The Word of God, not so. Because that Word existed before anything else and it made everything in conformity to it, right? And so one example of this is a kingdom. And in a kingdom, we see that there's a king and then we see that there is a, a hierarchy of individuals in his government all the way down to 
you know, the slave of the slave of the slave of the slave or, some, you know, some such thing. But there, but there is, there is a, a hierarchy. And of course, we see the same thing in our own, in our own government and in relationships and even in the church, right? There is a, a kind of hierarchy where you have elders and uh, deacons and then various, you know, perhaps various other people the um you know people with operating in their their gifts and fruits and so on um we see the implication of this hierarchy by the the name uh archangel and so let's see uh archangel there's two different scriptures that i have in the the front matter of the book dealing with angels. First Thessalonians 4.16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Jude uh, chapter 1, verses 8-9. through 9. Likewise, also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. Yet Michael the archangel... And then I I don't need to read the rest. The point the point is just simply the word archangel, right? Arche in in Greek means like chief, and so the the fact that there's some who are referred to as angel, and then there's some that are referred to as arche angel, archangel, right? There there is an implied hierarchy there. Um, the the word uh, principality and powers that God is. Let's see where I have this at. God is teaching. God is teaching the angels. And so Ephesians 3 verses 9 through 10. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Which from the beginning of the world hath hidden Christ. Hath hidden God who created all things by Christ Jesus. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places. Might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. And so principalities and powers. Then let me find this other verse. Is this these things are just um, occurring to me as I'm speaking, but um, Colossians chapter one verse sixteen. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. And so, um, all all of these things are. All of these things, th there's some kind of a relationship between them. And the point here is not to necessarily try and flesh out what that relationship is, but the point is to say that that there is absolutely a hierarchy among angels and among spiritual powers. And so then we've established, I think, that there's lots and lots of angels all over the place. Um and then the point that as we see that there are different kinds of people with different kinds of personalities and different kinds of gifts, God has also created different kinds of angels. And I mean, doesn't that just make, doesn't creation teach us that? The book of, cre the book of nature, and we see that God has made just such a very great, you know, biodiversity, just a very great variety of things. And he uses those things in their estate to accomplish whatever purpose that he has. Um, there are, for just taking one example of scavengers in nature. So a scavenger may be a vulture, a scavenger may be an ant, a scavenger may be the little, the little, uh, I don't know what they're called, but the little birds, the little, little cute little birds that fly around and just get little nibbles of stuff and it's like there's so, there's so many scavengers in nature and in one sense they all do cockroaches in one sense they all do a similar kind of activity but yet there's very great distinction even in them carrying out that same activity and so doesn't it doesn't it just make sense and from from our own human relationships like how um people who do one kind of a job and even in that that one kind of job that people are doing, there's just a very great variety of perspectives and strengths and ideas and vision and all, all this kind of stuff. Doesn't it make sense 
that we would expect uh, no less in God's creation of angels. And perhaps, perhaps I suspect probably vastly, vastly more than anything that we've experienced. I suspect that most of God's creation we, we've never actually even seen or encountered um, because I believe that probably most of God's creation is actually spiritual. But that so the different kinds, some of the different kinds of angels that we're told about in Scripture. And so we have seraphim in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 2. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne high and lifted up. And so this is a throne room, one of the glimpses, few glimpses we get in Scripture into the throne room in heaven. Uh, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. With twain he covered his feet. And with twain he did fly. And they cried out, holy, 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 right? Uh, cherubim. In Ezekiel, again, we're sort of having a, a sort of a throne room encounter. I guess that's earlier in Ezekiel, but we we have these angelic encounters recorded in uh, Ezekiel chapter 10. I don't know how much I want to read here. Uh, so 10, starting in verse 8, And there appeared in the cherubim in the form of a man's hand under the wings. And when I looked, behold, the four wheels by the cherubim, one wheel by one cherub and another wheel by another cherub, had the appear- and the appearance of the wheels was as a color of beryl stone. And as for their appearances, they had, they four had one likeness as if a wheel had been in the midst of a wheel. And when they went, they went upon their four sides. They turned not as they went. Okay, and then um, verse 14, And every one had four faces. The first face was the face of a cherub. Now, what does that look like? I don't know. The, the, uh, the second face was the face of a man. The third face was the face of a lion. And the fourth was the face of an eagle. And the cherubim were lifted up. And this is the living creature that I saw by the river of Chabar. And when the cherubim went, the wheels went with them. When the cherubim lifted up their wings to mount up from the earth, the same wheels also turn not from beside them. Okay. And so there's, there's a number of descriptors along those lines in Ezekiel. The horsemen in Zechariah. Um, I'll read, there's one in chapter 1, 7 through 11, but I'm going to read Zechariah 6, 1 through 5. And I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked and behold, there came four chariots uh, out from between two mountains. And you remember um, there's multiple references to angelic chariots. Elisha and his servant saw the chariots of Israel. Uh, and whenever Elijah was carried up to heaven, it was a sort of a chariot of fire, right? And so I turned, lifted up my eyes and looked and behold, there came four chariots from between two mountains and the mountains were mountains of brass and the first chariot were red horses and the second chariot black horses and the third chariot white horses and in the fourth chariot grizzled and bay horses. Then I answered and said unto the angel that talked with me, what are these, my Lord? And the angels answered and said unto me, these are the four spirits of the heavens which go forth from standing before the Lord of all the earth. And so it's interesting, they're a spirit, but yet they have an appearance. And of course, the appearance, as it is described to us, is that they are like horses. Um, We have guardian angels. And so this certainly has been, uh, you know, there there is uh, only one verse that I know of specifically talking about this in the scripture, Matthew 18, 10, but you know, it's a very popular notion that people like to suppose that they have guardian angels and so on. Um, take heed that you despise not one of these little ones for I say unto you that in heaven, their angels do always behold the face of my father, which is in heaven. Okay. Um, so what, you know, what is, what is the relationship of these? Um, perhaps we might think of, uh, Psalm 91, where uh, God sends the angels to protect, I guess I might as well just read it since I'm saying it right now. How about that? Um, uh, 
91 verse 11 and 12. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in their hands lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. And so I don't, you know, as with the promises of God, they are conditional promises. They're not usually just a just a blatant promise that applies to every single person. And so even in verse 9, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high thy habitation. How many people on the earth have made the Lord their habitation? No, not very many. How many people who call themselves Christians have made the Lord their habitation? Probably not too many. Um, so, so we see that there are certain angels that are that are sent by the Lord to perform specific tasks. And of course, along the lines of the spiritual gifts, we could imagine that some are gifted in one way and another are gifted in another way. And then it makes sense that God sends the one that is, is gifted in the appropriate way. Um, we see angels of the church in Revelation. Um, Revelation 2, 1, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus. Right. I don't think I need to read anymore. Um, we know that angels are involved in... Whoops. We know that angels are involved in the affairs of men. Um, there's multiple scriptures in the New Testament. Um, 1 Peter 1.12, um, 1 Timothy 5.21. I'm going to sort of deal with this in another video. But um, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the ref sort of vague references to angels with respect to the people of God, that the angels are there and they're, they're witnessing what's going on um and then of course we already mentioned the the archangel and so the point is is that in god's creation of of the spirit realm and angelic spirits which are his servants and his ministers there is a very great number and there is a very great variety and just as say a surgeon picks the right tool for the job or a, a, a carpenter, a craftsman, picks the right, right tool for the job, wouldn't it make sense and wouldn't it be utterly reasonable for the Lord of hosts to pick the right tool for the job and send just the right angel for whatever purpose that he has? Uh, a lot of times whenever I see ambulances go by, I just I just pray God send your angels. Um, I sometimes I've had the you know because because I have the attitude if if you can choose between an angelic encounter or an encounter with the Holy Spirit who is eternal, infinite, He fills all things, He knows all things. Why would you settle for lesser? I mean, I all I just always have that that attitude. Why why would you? You know why? Why would you accept a penny on the ground when you can have a hundred dollar bill? Like why, why? Why would you do that? I I I don't know. Um. But nonetheless, God has created angels for a purpose, and He uses angels. Uh, a, a, God used angels to strengthen Jesus, and so Jesus. It was so interesting. Jesus was given the Holy Spirit without measure. And so me, I would kind of like to limit God and put God in a box and say, well, he has the Holy Spirit without measure. We don't need any little angels, except that even after he was tempted um, by the devil, uh, God sent angels to strengthen Jesus. When he was in Gethsemane, right before he was going to the cross, God sent angels to minister to him. Um, Jesus said, can I not pray presently to my father and he will send legions of angels and so there, there's no question that angels are there to serve God and to accomplish his purposes. Of course, the whole question is, how does God want to do it? Because God is creative. Every snowflake is different. Every star in all the trillions of galaxies are different. Every drop of rain is different. Um, God, we, we like to think of God doing the same thing all the time because it's easier for us to figure out. Sometimes we like to dumb God down to an algorithm where I press a button and the same thing happens every single time I press the button, right? Well, God is a person and angels are too. And so they, they just like you don't respond if somebody says maybe the same thing to you in every single context, God, God responds however he wants to, right? And he uses whatever tool that he wants to according to his power, according to his grace, according to his wisdom. 
according to his plan. And so then the, the question becomes, what, what does God want to do in any given circumstance? And angels are one tool, but by no means the only tool that God has made available to himself to use uh, for his glory, to um, see his kingdom come and to see his will be done.